Hello, everybody. Hey. Hey. We're, we're back. We're back. <laughs> at least How about for, that? At least, at least for this week. Yep. So it's Monday with Jesus. And we are, are winding up uh, year A in the lectionary and the calendar of the church year with um, the story uh, Jesus tells from Matthew 25. Uh, and I'm going to tell the story. Uh, this time. Anything, anything to say, Tom, before I make my Monday with you? Go for it. For telling the debut. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so here's the story. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will gather before him and he will separate the peoples one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and the sheep he will place at his right hand and the goats at the left. And then he will say to those at his right hand, come, you who are blessed by my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Well, then those who uh, are the righteous will say to the king, Lord, when, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And, and when did we see you a stranger and, and welcome you or, or naked and give you clothing? When did we see you sick or in, in prison and, and took care of you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, so you did it to me. And then the king will turn to those on his left and he will say, depart from me, you who are accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. I was naked and you gave me no clothing. I was sick. You did not take care of me. I was in prison and you did not visit me. Well, then those at the left will, will say to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or, or thirsty or, or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison not take care of you? And he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do that to one of the least of these, so you did not do it to me. And they will depart into eternal fire, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Right. So there you have it. Um, that's the story. It's sometimes called the last judgment, sometimes called the parable of the sheep and the goats. Um, Tom, you want to talk to us a little bit about the setting for this parable in um, the context of the Gospel of Matthew? You well, know, this is the end of uh, Jesus' teaching. In fact, it's the last uh, parable, the last story prior to the Passion narrative. So what follows this immediately is the plot of the chief priests and scribes to kill him. Uh, and it comes as the climax of Jesus' teaching, 
uh, where he's had you know five major speeches, uh, and this one is the longest uh, of them. Uh, so it's Matthew 23 through 25. It's the woes uh, to the Pharisees and Sadducees. It's the uh, the little apocalypse uh, in Matthew, and then this series of parables. And there are four parables that conclude uh, this teaching section of the gospel. And uh, this is the last, the climax of the of those uh, parables. Uh, and so that's, that's the context in Matthew. Okay. And in Jesus' ministry, uh, this is the climax of his teaching in the temple and the establishment of his authority as a teacher and a representative, as the son of man. Uh, so uh, this parable is uh, very important and has had a lot of impact in the history of interpretation and of the ministries of the church. Right, right so the, um, this would have been written in Greek originally, if I'm correct, how, what, um, like, how is a translation of this parable? Yeah, well, it's pretty good. Uh, you know, I always have, uh, you know, quibbles and stuff about the translations, and, uh, and they're usually appropriate. Uh, but in this case, uh, one of the controversies is the, the word uh, that is translated nations, all the nations. In Greek, it is ethnoi, uh, from which we get ethnic. And uh, so uh, the Greek word uh, referred in the original context to the nations that dominated Israel over the, from the time of the sixth century until uh, Jesus' time. Uh, so it was first the Babylonians and the Persians and the Egyptians and the Greeks, uh, the Syrians, and finally the Romans. That was the nations. And so all of them, this parable has the vision that all of them are brought before the Son of Man uh, for judgment uh, at the last things, at the last days. Uh, so that's, the, I think it's better translated as the ethnics uh, rather than as the nations. Right. Uh, Speaking in of- In part because of its associations now. Right. Speaking of judgment, <laughs> um, seems like if I recall correctly earlier in Matthew, uh, Jesus is, teaches not that we are not supposed to judge. So, you know, one of his strong teachings seems to be don't don't be judgmental, don't judge others. Well, here is like major judgment going on, <laughs> and, and, and we've got this huge contrast. And I know, so this is Jesus, this is God, this is, um, but still, uh, in this very stark contrast, um, eternal. You know, the, those who don't do what they're supposed to do are going to go into eternal fire. Um, and I think I didn't use the word punishment, but at the end, it's eternal punishment while the righteous go into eternal life. You can, you can sure see where all the preaching, you know, the hellfire and damnation stuff comes from. So I don't know what comment on that for me, if you would, please. Well, uh, it is, uh, I don't know, it's that it, it really isn't paradoxical. Uh, the, uh, this establishes Jesus as uh, as somebody, you know, who uh, exercises authority. And, uh, but it is in a context in Jesus' ministry, he never hurts anybody. Uh, the uh, closest to that is the demonstration in the temple where he overturned the tables of the money changer, but nobody was hurt. Uh, they picked up their business a half an hour after he had done that and continued. Uh, so uh, Jesus is wholly nonviolent. Uh, but this is an establishment of the authority of the criteria by which the nations, peoples, the church, individuals will be evaluated in the scales of judgment of, the, uh, of God's kingdom. And so uh, 
it is uh, it is a parable that is structured to re to encourage, indeed to compel uh, people to reflect on their status in relation to these norms of evaluation uh, that uh, uh, God has uh, that that Jesus administers. Uh, and I would say there's nothing that motivates good behavior like some good well-placed guilt. And uh, in this case, everybody who hears this parable ends up guilty because everybody has at some point or another not done these things for that Jesus names. Uh, so, well, you're right, you're right that it, it is motivating because I know it's it was a motivating teaching for why I got involved in prison ministry. Um, and after recruiting a uh, uh, number of women from my local congregation, um, you know, all of whom were afraid to go inside to a jail, uh, but they did. And when we were um, talking about how it had been for us after several weeks, you know, all of them said they felt like um, I mean, they'd, they'd really learned a lot from the experience from the women who were inside the jail uh, in the context of, we were doing what I call circle the word, learning biblical stories. Um, but they, they all felt like they kind of were finally maybe becoming um, really faithful disciples of Jesus. They were doing what he taught. And it's right here in this, in this scripture, this teaching that we have, uh, an expectation to... Uh, among other things, visit those who are in prison. Um, it also, as you talk, it made me, reminded me that I had uh, used this scripture earlier in, in the fall. We had a series at church called Vote and Live uh, with a, some guest speakers on the importance of voting. Um, and I, I told this scripture, and I remember now introducing it, that we, uh, as we consider the policies that we want to promote and the, the, those, the candidates we'd be voting for, we might want to consider Jesus's priorities. And here they are you know, laid out very clearly. Um, so we might want to vote for candidates that seem to have, uh, be leaning towards at least considering these priorities as part of what they would you know, promote in the government. Right. Yeah. Um, but, and the, my third thought, <laughs> all this came while you were speaking, um, there is, while we like to think of uh, the merciful side of God, uh, the loving side of God, there is a need for justice as well. Um, and, and so there's a way in which this does say that in one way or another, you know, God will, there will be justice in the end. And, and those who have not cared for the least, um, you know, th there will be, be reckoning about that. And especially, I suppose, if they have have actually hurt uh, the most vulnerable of society. Um, so anyway, those are some thoughts I have on that. Uh, let's see. Um, what do you think local churches should do in response to this teaching? Well, it's pretty clear. You know, you could take this as an evaluation of the programs of a local church. You know, to what degree are they responding to the needs of those who are hungry in their community? To what degree are they responding to the, the needs for clean water? Uh, and uh, to what degree are they welcoming uh, immigrants uh, and uh, those who are outside their particular ethnic group uh, who are strangers to them? Uh, to what degree are they participating in clothing programs for the very poor who have, don't have enough clothes? Uh, to what degree are they involved in uh, visiting and caring for those who are sick? Uh, and then in relation to the, the American system of mass incarceration, what are they doing to go to and provide support for those who are in prison? Uh, those are criteria that every local church could use as criteria for their own programs. To what degree are they doing those things? And most, a lot of them would end up uh, on the negative side of that evaluation of that report card. Uh, they'd get uh, 
D's and F's uh, in relation to the most of those criteria. So it could be a wake up call for local churches in relation to their priorities and exploring what can they do as disciples of Jesus Christ uh, in relation to these priorities of the kingdom and of the things that uh, their Lord and Master, you know, valued. I, I would hope you know, that they would also think not just sort of individually, you know, like, I mean, it's great to support food pantries, there's a certain need for that, but also to think more communally, more systemically, for example, I think of Bread for the World, for, for example, that's an organization that, that lobbies on behalf of hungry people. Um, and with almost all of these kinds of these things that G are on Jesus's to-do list, there are um, kind of more sy systemic efforts to yeah. make, to create a society that does feed the hungry, welcome the stranger, um, and, and visit those in prison in kind of a metaphor metaphorical sense. Sure. Well, you can think about it in relation to the evaluation of the programs of and policies of the American government yeah. uh, in our context. You know, there were hunger programs that were initiated that were making a significant difference. Almost all of those have been uh, cut back uh, and marginalized. Uh, you know, let's not even begin to talk about our immigration policies as a nation. Then, right. <laughs> yeah. uh, then, you know, we, we now have a really vicious immigration policy in relation to the traditions of welcoming immigrants that have been part of the United States for decades, for centuries. Uh, it's been a characteristic mark. That has all been turned around in the recent uh, government policies. It's also true in relation to uh, the uh, systems of mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. And now people are being, you know, on, on the one hand, because of COVID, they can't go. But it's also that uh, programs to enable the rehabilitation of people who have uh, committed crimes or who have been unjustly uh, imprisoned. Uh, those things are being marginalized. Uh, so it does then, this parable is about the implications of social and politics. And what then uh, do we support uh, and encourage and empower our governments to do. Yep. Yep. Anything else you want to tell us um, about this story, the the impact in the original context of the story, or anything else before we sign off? Well, you know, I think about this parable as a biblical storyteller, and uh, and one of the things that is striking about this parable is, uh, and it's characteristic of Jesus' parables is the first half is good news for every listener. Everybody can identify some good thing that they did for some person sometime in their life uh, in relation to these priorities. And so the first half is kind of, oh, all right, you know, my blessed of my father and I've got, you know, I'm in, so to speak. Uh, the second half is a wake up call uh, in as much as you didn't do it to one of the least of these, uh, you didn't do it to me, everybody ends up uh, as subject to uh, eternal punishment. Uh, so the impact of the parable is, uh, for a listener, is to think, to evaluate, uh, you know, what am I doing? And uh, what are the implications of this for uh, what matters in relation to the big picture? Uh, so I, I think of that in relation to the, uh, the, the, the person who, you know, I, you were thirsty. Uh, we need global programs for clean water, uh, for the protection of the water and the air. Uh, so the programs for environmental and ecological uh, maintenance uh, and, and you know, saving of the environment uh, are clearly priorities here. Yeah. Uh, so one of the words that uh, I thought of is uh, 
that it should be translated as uh, cosmos, uh, as you know that that God's concern is from the foundations not of just of the world, but of the whole of the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a parable that is thinking in the big picture, and uh, is then an evaluation of uh, the policies of all of the ethnic groups, and especially those who are in positions of dominance right. uh, in relation to what do they do. Uh, As you describe the second half, not only does it you know, feel kind of motivating, but, it's, but as you say, it is also convicting because none of us can live up to what Jesus expects. And yeah. so that kind of leads us to gratitude for grace, that there is grace, um, as well as trying to maybe be a more faithful disciple along these lines. So. Yeah. Well, it's also uh, a parable of, of uh, you know, scare you into doing something. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Yep. No, okay, it's, we it's need a to kick talk. in the it's a kick in the butt yeah. to get moving and do <laughs> something like, rather than just talk about it or focus as people in the church on my salvation because I believe in Jesus. In this case, Jesus is saying, "Yeah, okay, what have you done what lately? Worked for me lately? <laughs> right? There's a sermon title. <laughs> what have you done right. for me lately? Okay, we need to sign off. <laughs> yep." Everybody, um, blessing for this week. And uh, this is a story for the coming Sunday, last Sunday in year A. Uh, and after that, we'll be into Advent. So God bless you all. God bless. And tell Go the story. It. This is a great story to learn. It's lots of repetition, easy to learn. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye.